Welcome back, people. I'm Daniel for Rock the JVM, and in this video, I'm going to talk about algebraic data types in Scala. Now, this video is concerned more about the data modeling problem of ADTs rather than a language problem, so only a small familiarity with Scala is required for this video. But I'll still recommend that you code with me in this video, and whenever you need to refresh your memory about these concepts, refer back to the video or to its written form in the blog with the link in the description. So without further ado, let me go to my code editor. I have a small object here, and we will solve some data modeling problems. So what are ADTs? ADTs are a way of structuring your data. So ADTs solve a data modeling problem. And the ideas behind the ADTs come from the Haskell programming language and the mathematical theory of functional programming. But although ADTs are often associated with functional programming, they're not exclusive to this style of writing code. And so many Scala libraries can use them proficiently, and the Akka library is one of them. So let's go into ADTs. Now I'm not going to start by describing the abstract nature of ADTs, but I'm going to start with a concrete example. So so let's say that we want to model weather forecasts. And for that, we defined a trait, for example, weather, and we have a bunch of objects that describe this weather. So for example, I would have a case object sunny, which extends weather, and a bunch of other case objects. Let's say we have windy, and then we have rainy, and then we have cloudy, and let's leave it at that. And because the weather can be either sunny or windy or rainy or cloudy, I'm going to make this trait sealed. And I'm pretty sure you know what sealed means. It means that no other Scala file can extend this trait other than the file that I'm working in right now. Cool, so if we have a hierarchy that looks like this, we've just defined our first algebraic data type or ADT. And this particular structure, this weather thing, is a so-called sum type. And it's a sum type because a weather, an instance of weather, can either be sunny or windy or rainy or cloudy. And so I can say here in the comment that weather is sunny or windy or rainy or cloudy. Now, truth be told, these ORs are actually exclusive ORs, and in Boolean logic, they are the same as the plus operator. So this weather type is also called a sum type, because the big type weather is summed up by the types sunny, windy, rainy, and cloudy, which are also the values of their own types, because I've defined them as case objects. So when you have a trait or an abstract type where you lay out all the possible cases, you've just defined a sum type, a sum algebraic data type. Now in Scala, we usually implement a subtype as a sealed trait or a sealed abstract class. And this helps us with pattern matching in particular because the compiler can figure out if we haven't exhausted all the cases. So for example, if I define a method called feeling, which takes a weather instance as an argument, and this returns a string, and I'm just going to pattern match against the weather. So weather match, and I would use case sunny, and I would say, I would return, for example, this smiley face. And then if I have a case cloudy, I will return, for example, a straight face. And if I have a case rainy, I would return a sad face, for example. Now, because the weather is a sealed trait, the compiler warns me that the match may not be exhaustive. It would fail on the pattern that I've not matched against. So this is why we use sealed traits or sealed abstract classes. Now, for better binary compatibility, you would use a sealed abstract class because sealed abstract classes cannot be mixed together. And on the same token, we use case objects here for the various options that we have because case objects give us a set of useful features. For example, the unapply method allowing us to use them in pattern matching we have free implementations of equals and hash codes and the extension of serializable so we can send these values over the network so we've discussed about a sum algebraic data type i'm now going to discuss about a product type and i'm going to define a case class and i'm going to name this weather forecast request this is something that we would send to a web service that would give us some data related to weather forecasts. And for example, I would like to pass some latitude and longitude of the place where I would like the weather forecast. So I'm going to say latitude as a double, 
and longitude as a double. All right. Now, this case class also defines its constructor. So if you know the Scala basics, when you define a class and you pass in some arguments, then you also define its primary constructor. So in order to instantiate one of these weather forecast requests, you would need to pass a latitude and longitude. Now, in the language of types, this is equivalent to a function that is of the form double and double, and then you would return a weather forecast request, abbreviated WFR for short. And so for every pair latitude and longitude, you can define a weather forecast request. And so the weather forecast request type, WFR, is essentially a Cartesian product between double and double, because for every pair, you can define a weather forecast request. Now, this Cartesian product type is called an algebraic product data type. And product types are usually implemented in Scala as case classes. So when you define your data models, you should use case classes. Now, case classes, as you're probably aware, have a lot of features baked in. For example, companions with apply methods. You have the serializability, which you also saw in objects. You have equals and hash codes and two string already implemented for you and a bunch of other features. So case classes are a really powerful tool for this. So the type representing a weather is a sum type, and the type representing a request to our weather forecast server is a product type. There's also a mixture of those, and we call those hybrid types. And because we have a hybrid type, we will have a sum of various product types. So I'm going to define hybrid types. For example, I'm going to use a sealed trait, and I'm going to define the response type that our weather forecast server will get back to us. I'm going to call this forecast response, or let's call this weather forecast response. Now, this is the trait. Now, let's say that this server gives back two kinds of answers to us. I'm going to define a case class, let's call this valid, and I'm going to contain a weather inside. So I'm going to use weather here and extends weather forecast response. So this is the valid response. And I'm going to also define a case class for invalid. And I'm going to wrap, for example, an error as a string and the description of that error or the reasoning behind it as a string. And this also extends weather forecast response. Now, the type weather forecast response, because it has a bunch of possible cases, is a sum type. But each of the possible cases is a product type. And same for the other. So we have basically a sum of product types, which is a hybrid type. So we've discussed about the main types of algebraic data types. But what are the main advantages there? And I'm going to mention a few. First of all, and probably one of the most important advantage of algebraic data types and of this style of structuring your data is that illegal states are not representable. And I'm going to exemplify what I mean by that a little bit later. The second advantage is that ADTs are highly composable. That is, we can use ADTs within other ADTs. And just to give an example, this hybrid type is a perfect example because the weather, which is also an ADT, was used in one of the cases for the weather forecast response. So they can highly compose with each other. The third advantage is that ADTs usually store only data. That is, they store the arguments with which they are constructed, or they themselves are the values of the potential data structure. So they contain just data, not functionality. And this composed with the principle of functional programming, this leads to immutable data structures and all the advantages that come with that. For example, it's very, very easy to track which value came from where in our code with immutable data structures. This comes from experience and also advantages related to parallel and distributed applications because no thread can mutate a data structure. It will have to create a new one. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that this should be an advantage of its own, so this should deserve its own bullet point. And because of the fact that ADTs are just data and not functionality, this makes it easier for us to structure our code in general. 
and make it easier for us to publish libraries and data type definitions. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that illegal estates are not representable. This is one of the major advantages of ADTs. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to our weather trait. Instead of the weather trait and with the, all these case objects, we could have said something like type, let's call this naive weather, which is a string. And instead of using that weather type, we should have used or we could have used a string. And for example, we could have said, let's call this naive feeling. If you remember this feeling method that gets a weather as an argument, naive feeling could have had a weather as a string. And there you would have weather match. And then you have case sunny. And then you would put on that smiley face and so on and so on. So here you would have some other cases. Now, what would happen if you do naive feeling and then you pass in the string, let's say 45 degrees? What do you do then? Most likely your application doesn't support this kind of string. And so this method would fail with a match error. But this is a very, very easy case. If you have a large code base with lots of states that you do not account for, this kind of invalid argument will crash your entire application and you don't want that. And so you want to limit the kind of values that you accept here in this method. And so instead of a string, which is a very loose kind of data, you use this seal trait and then you explicitly allow these options to handle in your application. So this is what I meant by illegal states not representable, because with this kind of seal trait and this hierarchy, you would not be able to pass anything else than sunny, windy, rainy or cloudy. This is the big argument of making illegal states unrepresentable. There's also a soft argument for reducing the complexity of an ADT. What do I mean by that? The complexity of an ADT is the number of possible values of that ADT. Now, our goal while designing an application for the real world and modeling our data for the business logic that we want to implement is to reduce this complexity. And how can we reduce the complexity? Well, one way of reducing the complexity of the weather type would be to explicitly allow for the possible values that you might want to support. So not necessarily for making illegal states unrepresentable, but to reduce the possible cases that you might want to account for and create tests for. Now, for the code example that I wrote here with invalid, we have two arguments here in the form of a string. Now, this description is a string and you might have various kinds of descriptions, long and short. You cannot possibly account for all the possible values and so you leave that as a string. But the errors are usually finite in number. So you shouldn't really account for errors as a string, but for a finite set of possible values. So a possible improvement would be to define an ADT for your error. So for example, you would have a sealed trait, let's call this weather server error. And then you would define some case objects for that. So case object, for example, not found or not available, extends weather server error, and some other cases. And instead of using a string for an error, you would use this new type, which would limit the complexity of this data type and greatly improve the testability of your application. So you learned about ADTs, algebraic data types in Scala. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe and check out the written form of this video at blog.rockthejvm.com as you'll find more details there, including why these data types are called algebraic. In the meantime, follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn for fresh updates on upcoming material and check out the Rock the JVM website. I have tons of material there. In the meantime, I'm Daniel signing off.